Welcome back to Black Box Recaps. Today I will show you a crime, drama, thriller film named The Town. Spoilers ahead. So, watch out and enjoy. The neighborhood of Charlestown, Boston is known for its high amount of bank robberies all year long. For long life friends are particularly good at it, Doug, Jim, Glonzy, Doug is the brain behind their plans, and he tells the other three all the details they need to memorize without fail before their next operation. When a guard enters the bank carrying a money bag, they take the chance to push him and enter with him, immediately taking control of the situation. Every person present is thrown to the ground, their cell phones are taken, and after the thieves empty the cashier station, they make manager Claire Kesey open the vault. After taking all the money and putting the security camera's hard drives in a microwave to destroy them, the thieves start pouring bleach all over the place to take care of any possible DNA proof. Unaware that, Claire is pressing a silent alarm button with her foot until it is too late. When they finally notice, Jim beats up the assistant manager believing it was him, and as he violently moves, Claire gets to see his neck tattoo. Seeing as the police are about to surround them, Jim decides to take Claire with them as a hostage, which is something they never do. They blindfold her before taking off their masks and once they are far enough from the bank, they drop her at the beach, not needing her anymore. The crime scene is taken over by the FBI, with Special Agent Adam Frawley in charge. He can see the thieves took care of every possible detail and left no evidence behind, which means they must be professionals. His men also find the van they used for the robbery, but it has been lit on fire and nobody in the neighborhood is willing to speak as a witness. The next day, Frawley interrogates Claire, who tells him the little she knows and omits the tattoo detail, because the thieves have threatened to kill her if she gives the FBI any information. Meanwhile, the four thieves get together to discuss Jim's awful idea of taking a hostage, but when he arrives, he brings worse news, he has Claire's ID, and has noticed she lives near them, so she will see him in the neighborhood often. Afterward, Doug and Jim go around the neighborhood to do all necessary payments to their gun dealer, their car dealer, and Fergie, an Irish mobster whose front is a flower shop. Then they spend the evening drinking, gambling, and taking drugs with call girls. The following night, the four of them are having a drink at a bar when they are approached by Chris, Jim's sister, and a single mother. The next day, Doug starts following Claire around and enters the laundromat after her. When she starts crying because she finds faded bloodstains on her shirt, he takes the chance to make contact, pretending to comfort her. To make her feel better, he takes her out for a drink. They chat and bond. Then he takes her on a boat ride. This kind of knowledge can only be acquired while working somewhere like Vericom, so they start looking into work records and employee profiles. Frawley also meets Claire for lunch to ask her some more questions and tries to flirt with her, but she mentions she is already sort of seeing someone. Claire and Doug start going out together, a fact Doug keeps hidden from his gang. The closer they become, the more they share about each other. Claire admits she is working with the FBI, and Doug pretends to be simply curious to ask her if they have any possible suspects. So after dropping her at her home, Doug picks up Jim and together they go intimidate the assaulters. Doug only beats them up and plants some drugs, telling them to leave before the weekends, but Jim gets too much into it and shoots the guy's leg before taking off his mask and showing him his face. Doug isn't happy with how violent Jim has been lately. Meanwhile, Frawley finds Dez's file as a Vericom employee, whose sick days match the dates of various bank robberies. This allows them to follow him into a family barbecue and discover the identities of the whole gang, although they still are missing hard evidence to catch them. For now, Frawley orders his agents to keep surveillance on all of them. While having lunch together on a sunny day, Claire tells Doug that this weather reminds her of the day her brother died. They get some hair from a hair salon to plant as fake evidence, wash thoroughly, and clean all their equipment with bleach so it doesn't have fingerprints on it. Then they take the car to follow an armored truck and rob it as soon as it parks. Things go smoothly at first, but one of the guards tries to fight back and aims his gun at them. The police are also coming after them, so as not to waste any more time, they kill the guard and go back to the car, driving away as fast as possible not to get caught. They cause many crashes in the way, and when the cops finally corner them, 
they shoot them too before driving back and escaping through the way they come. This time Glonzi tries some risky driving moves that allow him to make the police cars crash against each other, and they finally get to lose them when they find their fourth team member waiting for them in another car, so they change vehicles and light the previous car on fire, blocking the way for the cops. Frawley, who is following the case from his office, orders the police to close the bridge, but it is too late, the thieves cross it before the cops get there. As they change vehicles again, they are seen by a random officer that is parked nearby, but he turns a blind eye to them. While they don't have any legitimate proof to use yet, Frawley wants to at least talk to them, so he sends his men to bring the four of them in for interrogation. After making them read the lines the thieves said to the victims, Frawley tries to ask some questions, but Jim simply stays silent after requesting a lawyer, and Doug, knowing they have nothing on him, tells him they have always known they have been followed by the FBI, because everyone knows what their antennas look like. Frawley's next move is to try to get some clues from Claire again, but when he calls the bank, he finds out she has quit. Getting suspicious of her now, he makes his men tap her phone and learns she has been in contact with Doug all this time. Doug also learns she quit when he meets with her to give her a diamond necklace, so he takes the chance to ask her to go away with him, which she accepts. After their date is over, Claire is visited by Frawley, who notices the necklace before showing her Doug's profile and telling her the truth. Meanwhile, Doug meets with Jim, who has a new job from Fergie, but Doug turns it down and tells him to find someone else because he is done. This enrages Jim, who accuses him of abandoning Chris and her baby, but Doug reminds him nobody knows who the father is, and while he is thankful Jem's family took him in as a kid, it was never going to be the three of them happily playing house. If he doesn't accept the job, Fergie threatens to do to Claire the same thing he did to his mom. Doug rushes to Claire's place to check she is fine, but she kicks him out and doesn't let him apologize or explain. From then on, he tries to keep an eye on her apartment and sees one of Fergie's thugs hang a funeral wreath on her door. Doug destroys it as he finally accepts he will have no choice but to accept this job. After visiting Chris to tell her he will be gone after this job, Doug tries to approach Claire again and promises he will never hurt her, because he has robbed many banks, but he has never killed anyone, then asks her to wait for him before leaving. The gang gets together to hear Fergie's plan, he has inside information to rob Fenway Park, and they will do it the morning after the big game when their safes will be full. While they go over the details, Frawley approaches Chris at a bar, thinking she may be the weak link in the family. After fake flirting with her, he shows her his badge and implies he knows she is a mule for Fergie. When she asks for a lawyer, he makes his move and sows the seed of discord by pointing out that even if she was together with Doug for many years, he never bought her a diamond necklace. Chris gives him a fake lead, so on the day of the operation, Frawley and his men follow the wrong truck while Chris visits Doug to ask him to take her with him because she also wants a new life, but Doug kicks her out after telling her he is leaving with someone else. While Diz uses his electrician knowledge to disable the alarms and security cameras, Doug and Jim dress up as cops and are allowed inside the stadium by contact of Fergie's. They come across some employees and guards, but their police act doesn't work out and soon they are taking out their guns and making the men lower themselves to the floor so they can tie them up. Next, they go up to the cash room and tell the employees to open the door and not to make a distress call because they have men outside their homes and they will shoot their wives if they try anything. Obviously, they are allowed to come in and after filling their bags with as much money as possible, they leave through the parking lot where Glonzi and Des are waiting for them with an ambulance. The FBI is already surrounding the perimeter, but as soon as Jim sees them trying to sneak in, he opens fire on them. A shootout between thieves and agents begins, and Glonzi gets shot in the middle of it, but at least they got him on the vest. While the other three continue to shoot, Des sneaks back and opens the door so they can push the truck with the agents out of there. After he closes the door again, Doug tells Des that, unlike the others, he doesn't have a police record so he can walk out and get only seven years and none of them would blame him for it. Des however, feels rather insulted by this and stays after throwing the F-word at Doug. The FBI throws some stun grenades through the windows then, and while the thieves' senses are compromised, they send special agents inside that shoot Des as soon as he stands up. Glonzi decides to go for a very risky plan, 
he will drive out and keep the FBI's attention on him while Doug and Jem change back into their cop costumes and simply walk away through the main door because the FBI won't be looking for police officers. Doug worries about Glonzy's safety if he goes out there, but Glonzy promises he is a great driver and knows how to escape. While the FBI checks out the ambulance, thinking all the thieves will be there, Doug and Jim successfully change into their cop uniforms and easily escape by mingling with other officers. The trick doesn't last long however, the FBI receives information from the employees that had been tied up inside, saying they had been ambushed by cops, so Frawley immediately starts looking around for officers behaving suspiciously. He quickly notices Jim walking away fast with a big bag over his shoulder and follows him into a parking lot. As soon as Frawley calls him by his name, Jim opens fire on him, and soon he finds himself surrounded by the FBI and cops while Doug watches from across the street. Frawley manages to wound Jim on the leg, so he hides behind a mailbox, only to realize he is out of bullets. Refusing to go back to jail, he commits suicide by walking out with his guns in hand, causing the agents to shoot him on the spot. Doug doesn't let his sacrifice be in vain and escapes by stealing a police car, while everyone is busy checking on Jim's body. He drives to the flower shop and kills both Fergie and his thug, not getting hurt in return because he is wearing a bulletproof vest. Afterward, Doug recovers some money he had hidden and calls Claire, who has the FBI with her in the apartment listening to her conversation. Claire asks him to come over, claiming she is alone, but Doug knows she is lying because he is watching the apartment from a neighbor's building. He still accepts to go though, asking her to meet him at the back door in an hour. After he apologizes again to her, Claire mentions sunny days as a subtle clue to let him know it is all a trap, and Doug plays along. While the FBI waits with Claire for someone that won't arrive, Doug hides some money in her garden and leaves a note on Frawley's car, insulting him. Days later, she finds the money Doug left for her with a note saying one day they may see each other again. She decides to donate it to refurbish the local ice hockey arena, where Doug once played in memory of his mother. Thanks for watching. Please comment your favorite movie name for recap. Subscribe our channel and stay tuned.